Yeah, so in fact, the uh, Kitpeak just solicited proposals for 10% uh, of operation on, of these telescopes for five years from universities uh, mm -hmm. for in exchange for money or in kind services. At the going rate was for 10%, I believe it was $400,000 a year for 10% of the time. There's actually a good reason why we didn't go for the big telescopes. Uh, for one thing, we use the two telescopes because they're nearly identical. It turns out the Blanco's a tiny bit smaller. The plate scale of the Blanco is a little bit larger, but it's, it's a few percent in fact. Um, and they're situated at plus 30 latitude and minus 30 latitude, so you actually get the whole sky, which is very nice. But the big reason is that these telescopes were built in the 1970s, stretching it a little bit. The, the Maya was built in the late 60s. Uh, and they were <coughs> optimized for photographic plates. And photographic plates were big. They were designed to have big, well-defined focal planes. The telescopes built in the 1990s, the 10 meters, have itty, itty, bitty mm. focal planes. Because no one ever thought CCDs would ever get big. And so while you can collect a lot of light with Keck, it's all within the inner six arc minutes. If you want a wide field imager, you go to the old telescopes. The last telescope built with this big field of view before the current generation that's being built was the CFHT built in the mini. Identical instrumentation makes the calibration easier. And just before we started, of course, these things were fitted with big cameras. This is the mosaic camera with a person sitting there for scale. This is the filter wheel of the camera. The camera sits inside the doer. It's an, it's an eight chip mosaic, eight two by four K <laughs> chips. So it produces an eight K by eight K image covering about 34 minutes of arc. In addition, the mosaic camera lives here at prime focus. So we don't have to worry about a secondary reflection to, to mess up our image quality at all. So this gives you the best possible image quality for the telescope and site. And unfortunately, the, the, the one thing you pay for by using 1970s telescope is that you have 1970s domes and buildings, big hulking monstrosities that create their own dome seeing. So the seeing isn't so fantastic, which hurts our lensing projects a bit. The typical seeing at, at Kitt Peak with mosaic is around 0.95 to 1 arc second, which sounds decent, but it's not as good as, as the telescope, the wind telescope built 400 feet away, built 12 years later, does 0.3 arc seconds better regularly because they built it with a modern dome. But wind doesn't have as big a field of view, so we're stuck. So this is what the sky looks like. This is four square degrees of the sky to about 26 magnitude, 26 and a half. Magnitude. And this is one of the problems with giving these talks, is that this looks incredibly unimpressive. And the problem is one of resolution mismatch. So to make this a little bit better, I'm going to take 1.6% of the survey, one ninth of the previous image, and to show you that. This looks a little better, but it's still incredibly unimpressive. Because every single one of these tiny little smudges is a galaxy. So I'm going to take half a percent of the previous image. <coughs> and now we're starting to get to the things we're interested in. The things you're interested in measuring the shapes for are these things. These are the 26 to 26 and a half mag magnitude galaxies that are distant enough to be behind these things, which are the foreground galaxies. So by reference, I believe this one is about 20 and a half. Okay. And now we're actually in a position to make the comparison between what you see and what's there. And it turns out in this particular area of the sky, there's one big accumulation of clusters of galaxies. And you can sort of see it here. It's in this little clump here. It's much less impressive because it's at redshift point 0.3. Uh, there's one clump at redshift point 0.3, another one at redshift point 0.4. And so the galaxies in them are not so bright. The brightest ones are about 19th magnitude. So they don't stand out next to the stars in our own galaxy or the nearby galaxies at redshift less than 
but in the mass they sure stand out. And you can start seeing where the clusters of galaxies are. These things have masses of 10 to the 14, a few times 10 to the 14 times the mass of the sun. <coughs> okay. So much for dark matter. I still have Okay. It turns out the universe is actually much more bizarre than, it, than when we started thinking about this. In 1998, and people were actually thinking about it a few years before, researchers discovered that the universe isn't only expanding. That's been known for a long time. Uh, it's that the expansion is accelerating. And so that if you draw a diagram of distance versus velocity, the so-called Hubble diagram, we live in this universe. Whereas we actually thought we lived in this universe. And dark energy is a bizarre thing. The discovery was done based on something called a supernova. I'm guessing most of you have heard of it. This is a picture of a supernova. It's actually not the kind of supernova that was used for this study. This is a type 2 supernova. This is a supernova 1987A. But unfortunately, we're not fortunate enough to see it here. Did anyone actually, was anyone in a position to see it from the southern hemisphere? Several of my colleagues said that they had serious problems observing it because none of the telescopes in uh, the Southern Hemisphere observatories that were small enough for it not to saturate it had spectrum bounds. So they basically couldn't get a spectrum of the thing for days because they had to go and find all the neutral density filters they could find to stack in front of it. Because this thing got the first magnitude, and no one takes a mag spectrum of first magnitude star. <laughs> Type 1 supernovae, the ones that used for, for this explosion, are supernovae in which the exploding thing is actually a white dwarf. It's a white dwarf right near to the limiting mass of a white dwarf. White dwarfs can only hold themselves up under gravity, under gravity uh, if they're below a certain mass, because they're held together by electron. What happens when the white dwarfs exceed this mass is that they start contracting. And white dwarfs are made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, the end states of burning for low-mass stars. When they contract, they heat up, and all the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen turns to iron in a flash, releasing an immense amount of energy and blowing the thing apart. This is not what makes neutron stars. It's the massive stars that make neutron stars. Here, you blow the entire thing apart. What, what happens is you produce a limiting mass, which turns out to be about 1.4 solar masses, worth of iron. The amount of energy, because you're always producing the same amount of iron, is always about the same. <coughs> it turns out, because of the, de of the, the, convert the problems in, in the thermodynamic conversion of that kinetic energy and heat energy into light, the light output isn't completely constant. But it turns out that the explosions release almost the same amount of energy and the amount of light that they release can be calibrated, because it turns out the amount of light that's produced correlates with the amount of radioactive materials, which then power the fall off of the supernova. And so you can actually make them into standard candles. It's like knowing how bright something is. And then the distance can be found simply by the inverse square. That's, that's what makes type 1 supernovae interesting, is that you can do this to them. And so every supernova looks like every other supernova with the exception of one or two. There was one publicized a few months ago. Uh, but almost all of them look the same. And the idea is that you can then plunk them together into a plot of magnitude versus redshift, that's a distance versus velocity plot, just like the previous one, and sure that, sure enough, they all lie above the contracting universe. <coughs> So the question then arises, well, I'm an expert in gravitational lensing, but supernovae are only a byproduct of what I do. Uh, whenever you take lots of images in the sky, you always pick up supernovae. Yeah, that's kind of a good read. Uh, can gravitational lensing measure dark energy? Yes, and the reason is that gravitational lensing works just like a normal lens. If you change the distance of an object from the lens, you'll actually change what image you get.